Welcome to Weber Days at the Iowa City Public Library. My name is Maeve Clark and I'm coordinator of adult services. And during the month of May, the library celebrates not only National Historic Preservation Month and local history, but local historian Irving B. Weber. Irving B. Weber lived his entire life, nearly all of the 20th century in Iowa City. His family roots reach deep into early Iowa City. His maternal grandparents settled in Iowa City in 1839. His paternal grandparents came in 1857. Irving was born in 1900, the beginning of a new century. He went to Iowa City Public Schools, graduated from the University of Iowa in 1922. He's remembered for many things. University of Iowa's first All-American swimmer, founder of Quality Check Dairies, serving as its president until his retirement in 1966. Irving was active in the Iowa City Host Noon Lions Club in 1944, oops, sorry about that. In 1994, Irving B. Weber Elementary School was named in his honor. He may be most remembered, though, for the over 800 articles he wrote for the Iowa City Press Citizen, starting in 1973. Irving's view of history was not one of dull retelling of facts and names. He shared the story of what it was like to grow up in Iowa City, the best places to buy penny candy, the joys of cooling off in Melrose Lake in the summer, sledding parties on closed off streets. He recorded for future generations the story of Iowa City as no one else could. All of the articles Irving Weber wrote for the Iowa City Press Citizen are available online through the University of Iowa's Digital Library, a project made possible with the cooperation of the Iowa City Host Lions Club, the Iowa City Public Library, and Lolly Eggers, our former director. All are linked to the Iowa City Public Library through our online catalog. Irving B. Weber died in 1997, barely missing a century of life. Join us for the rest of the month for more programs during Weber Days. This coming Wednesday, we have a WOW event, Weber on Wednesday, in Meeting Room A here. Rachel Wobeder, U of I Museum Studies student, will present a talking history of Iowa City food from 1830 to 1900. So we're gonna get the beer caves today and then you can come back and get the food that they ate while they drank the beer. Refreshments will be provided by historic foodies. And the final Weber on Wednesday will be Tom Schuline, citizen historian, presenting a program on the history of Iowa City grocery stores from the corner store to the superstore. There are also a couple of other Weber Day events. On Tuesday, May 26th at noon, author and Hubert, Herbert Hoover presidential director, library director emeritus Timothy Welch will read from his new book, Images of America, Coralville. Our second to the last program will be the girl history detectives, sixth graders from the Lemmy School, sharing their research on their school's namesake, Helen Lemmy. And that will be Tuesday night, May 26th at 7 p.m. So if we've piqued your interest in local history or exploring family history, please take a trip upstairs to the second floor of the library. In fact, if you're really interested in finding your family's history, we have several classes on how to do genealogical research, and there's still places available. Upstairs, the second floor of the library, the library does indeed have a second floor, if you've never gone up there, is what I call the best floor of the library. Of course, that's where I work, and that's where the nonfiction collection is. And that's where you can read much more about local history. And we have a display this year, or this May, that's been done by the Iowa City Hist Friends of Historic Preservation. They're celebrating their 40th anniversary, how they came to be, and they have a marvelous display. You can take part in the scavenger hunt, learn about uh, Iowa City's historic districts, and see for yourself what Iowa City looked like in the earlier century. And when you're home, you can explore even more of Iowa City's history through Iowa City Public Library's digital portal, history.icpl.org. So if you got a postcard when you came in, you'll see the address at the top of that. But let's go to today's program. Today's program is on breweries, prohibition, and the beer caves of Iowa City with some of Cedar Rapids thrown in as well. And it's a topic I've, it's long intrigued me. And one of my goals, in fact, it's right at the top of my life goals is to get into those caves <laughs> someday, somehow. Anyway, enough about that. But until that time, I will do the very best next thing, and that's to learn about the breweries. And today, we are very fortunate to have Marlon Ingalls as our guide. Marlon undertook his undergraduate graduate and graduate work in anthropology and archaeology at Illinois State University in Normal, Illinois. He has worked as a professional archaeologist since 1978. 
From 1979 till 1985, he worked as a survey archaeologist, as both a prehistoric and historic archaeologist for many institutions, including the Illinois Department of Transportation and the Army Corps of Engineers. He was engaged to work in 1885 as an archaeologist and a historian for the Fermi Lab and the Department of Energy. Super, super, super conducting super collider project in Batavia, Illinois. And that's probably another story that would be fascinating, a deep cave as well. <clears throat> in 1989, he came to Iowa City to join the staff of the Office of the Iowa State Archaeologist and has been here for 26 years. During that time, he has worked on a variety of projects involving multidisciplines. His interest in brewery caves and the technologies involved in locating them developed as a subspecialty in architectural history and industrial archaeology. Please help me welcome Marlon. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to address you today. We all have a co common topic that we like, uh, beer and beer caves. And so um, let me get ready to go here. And um, this is a two-part story. Part of it is about the Iowa City and Cedar Rapids beer caves and their history and their um, beginnings. And the other side of it is uh, technological on remote sensing and how to find subterranean vaults and vacuities or sinkholes or steam tunnels and elements like that using uh, new millennial technologies. And so it all kind of rolls together in that, in that uh, you can put the past and the history together through uh, history and technology. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. But uh, one of the first things is, is like a brewery and breweries. And this is uh, a shot from Cedar Rapids of the Magnus Brewery around the turn of the century. And you can see everything in, is horse drawn. It's hard working men, um, little taverns little restaurant places for a piece of sausage, and beer was expensive back then. In order to uh, keep people and customers in the saloons, free food. And so um, by the time you were there all day and you'd used up all your pay, at least you had a meal out of it before you went home. But uh, these uh, period pictures kind of can put one in the perspective of how it was to be there. And for the first part of this, you know, it's very much about trying to be in the place and time. Like this is the Iceman from the Englert Brewery here in Iowa City. A little bit later in time, this is probably up around 1910 to 1920 or something, there's still um, horses and it's still men carrying ice up your stairs and putting it in your back door in your ice box. And it's, uh, um, a lot of these breweries had monstrous ice houses and harvesting ice was a really large part of the whole industrial op operation. Making beer at this size, it's a factory, it's a beer factory and it runs on the gravity system and the gravity system is hot on the top where they're cooking the beer and then it runs down the pipes down into the, the caves at the bottom where the aging and the cooling takes place. And so these are monstrous buildings. They are buildings that are designed as factories. They now are, uh, well, the few surviving ones are office buildings. The other ones, by and large, have all been destroyed or renewal or some other element has taken them all down. So the very few that do survive and the ones that still survive in a shape and condition where you can actually go down and see the beer caves are very, very unusual. And I have tried Every place I've been as an archaeologist, again, in every beer cave and cave and mine and tunnel and root cellar and basement possible. So this is kind of where we're going. It's the Iowa City, it's Union Brewery is where we're going to start here and their brewery caves. And then we're going to break in uh, in the second half of the talk to the uh, remote sensing aspect. Now, these caves were done in a cut and cover situation where they dug down to the bedrock and then erected everything from rock ground up. And so they were constructed in the old uh, Boisseau arch method that the Romans developed. Basically, what would happen, they would go in with timbers, they would put the timbers in, they would put the rock arch on top of the timbers, and then they would 
once the keystones were in, they would pull the supports out, move them down, and start the next section, and the next section, and the next section. Well, several of these uh, caves have anywhere, uh, most of them have one or two. Um, some of them have up to 11. So it was quite an extensive uh, situation and capital investment to start this and what they would do after these caves were in, and in uh, Brewery Square here, they are in several levels. That's just not one level of them, but the most intact and, uh, intact and deepest one is the most interesting to me. Um, then the uh, building, which were usually pretty large and expansive, were built on top of the caves. And there was an elevator system that took the beer up and down, and they took it out of, out of the bottom, um, part of the caves and bring it up the elevator and then they could distribute it onto the wagons and things. In the early days there wasn't any bottles or cans or anything. You bought it by the bucket or you bought it by the mug or you bought it by the cask. All right, kegs and casks. Casks cask are bigger than kegs, okay? So they're about twice as big and so we, you would see people um, moving these out on the street, and out on the street in the mid-1850s was a pretty miserable, muddy, horse manure-ridden place to be. And this is uh, the 1868 uh, view of Iowa City, and I have circled out where the breweries and, and are. There were three breweries, and uh, this one is the uh, Union Brewery, which I'm going to be talking about. This one over here is the Englert Brewery. And this is the Dostal Brewery. Now these two were torn down um, in the 1960s. The Dostal Brewery ac actually caught on fire in um, 1906. And unfortunately, the fire station is where uh, uh, John's Grocery is now. <laughs> they weren't able to put it out in time. So the whole thing was uh, gutted out. They just pushed it into the ground. And so all the caves, on both of these breweries are still down there, but there's really no access to them. Uh, the Union Brewery is the only one where there is any way at all to, to get to it. Um, here's the Union Brewery as it stood in 1879. You can see it's a, uh, they make it look a little bigger and better in the picture, of course, because that was how they sold these things and these plat books. And it is uh, uh, most of a block and there's multiple buildings. There's ice houses, there's woodsheds. There's mercantile uh, storefronts along here. There are um, sub cellars and things down there into the street. This is kind of the place where the old elevator was, where the uh, uh, beer would come out and be uh, loaded out to the wagons. This is the Dostal Brewery, which was kind of between where the Bluebird Cafe is and um, George's Tavern. And uh, it also is a very uh, large and elaborate uh, building, very Victorian in, in its uh, aesthetics, with a huge ice, ho ice house back here in the back. This covered uh, three quarters of a block here in town. And the Englert was about a half a block. So in, these, in the 1870s, what one would be seeing and doing as you went by would be hearing woodcutters. And you'd see flames belching out and wagons coming in and wagons going out and farriers and coopers and just uh, all kinds of different kinds of trades going on at the same time. Part of what we always start with in archaeology is the Sanborn Atlas is here. This is the brewery up here and th on this it kind of outlines where all the primary buildings were, the uh, houses, the ice houses, the Cooper shop, and um, down here was another house and a market, market and a grocery store. Of course, this is the Catholic church down on the corner from that. So this whole area was kind of a hub of activity going on outside. Brewing beer is kind of a quiet uh, business, whereas, um, you know, it's not a foundry. It's, it's not a giant mill or something like that that's got machinery and felting cloths going on. Nothing, nobody's pounding on big pieces of steel, but nonetheless, as I say, it would have been very, very busy. And it says there's no watchmen and uh, two hands sleep in the brewery. And um, what is very telling about this that it took me a long time to figure out what was this elevator right here. And that was how they brought the beer from way down into the ground. It's about 35 feet down at the bottom up to the first and second levels of the tunnels and then out into the city. So this is kind of what it, you have to go through a lot of stuff to get 
to the brewery situation. And it, you have to drop down this uh, shaft here on the left. And nobody, I've never been able to like explain to people what it's like to go down this hole down in the ground because there's nothing there. It caught on fire in 1927 and then all burned out. So I started, I inserted this little video about what it's like to walk up to the edge of this thing and look down. All right, so a lot of people get to the edge and turn around. About 20%. Uh, a lot of people come up and they look and they go away and they circle around and they circle around. And some of them, one girl said, if I don't do this, I'll never do something like this again in my life. So uh, she kind of, you might say, sucked it up and <laughs> went on down there and was just so pleased about the whole deal. Um, going down the ladders, you know, it's a one of a time, uh, one, of a, uh, one at a time business and uh, I'm usually the spotter. What mostly I wanted to show here is here's another tunnel that used to go under Market Street to the old hotel next door where the haunted bookstore um, was until just a short time ago. So these tunnels connected under the street to the hotel where they had a saloon over there. So that would be how they would uh, get the beer across the streets in the winter time and when it's really bad they could just trundle it underneath the street and it would come out in the basement of the other building. So as you're coming down the ladders, there are these uh, cut off tunnels that really don't go anywhere anymore. After the fire in the building and after various uh, reconstructions, it was, um, these were closed off and there's the one that goes across the street. So essentially this is down at the bottom and you're kind of looking up towards the top of the shaft. So there's at the bottom, you have to come down the ladder and down this pile of dirt, which is the remnants of the old fire. And then there's two tunnels down there that are in, uh, accessible. And one of them's about 113 or 14 feet long, and the other one's about 90 feet long. And they go off in different directions. This is essentially what they look like. Um, they're all brick. They're about 15 feet high and about 20, 25 feet wide, more or less. Um, you can see a, a line here where I think uh, at, when they put the fire out, this filled up with water. And also there's, uh, it, not so much in this picture, but there are all kinds of pieces where there used to be um, piping and vent holes. And back here uh, are uh, uh, lamp niches. Uh, the breweries were built before kerosene had been invented. Right? So you had to use whale oil, or you had to use fat, or you had to use rushes, or you had to use candles, or you had to use everything but kerosene, of course. When the fire came, this, these are the remnants of the old beer vats, and there's a series of these vats along the wall here. And uh, they were about six, six to eight feet across, and then when they all burned up, they just kind of collapsed down here in a heap. Now, kind of what I'm looking at here in the picture is this ghost door. Many of these breweries would have um, these um, arches put into the sides of them in case they wanted to expand later on. They could just go out through that door and dig out the hole and, and, uh, and start another uh, tunnel off that way. Um, in the 19, after uh, the 1920s and 30s mostly, um, during Prohibition, they, many breweries took to making um, soda pop or carbonated beverages. And so this is one of the old uh, cooling systems that was down there when the fire happened. And uh, it is, well, rusty at this point because it's always 55 degrees down there. It's always about 70% humidity, which is perfect if you're yeast. <laughs> so this, this, these are the aging places, that the, and you can see here where there's plumbing, the racks coming down, um, uh, doors to other sections of the tunnel so over here. It's a little hard from this angle. So I just wanted everybody to be familiar what these tunnels are, and what they look like when they're extant, when they're still standing, because many of them are still out there, but they're buried. And like sinkholes or like, uh, well, they, they collapse once in a while, all right? Like mine subsidence, things happen. And so um, this element of it is about how we use remote sensing, both to study this area around the breweries here in Iowa City and also in Cedar Rapids in a project that I did for the Department of Transportation. So we're using these uh, 
This one is about the electromagnetic conductive technique. So essentially what this is, um, well, let me, let me go into that in a minute. Again, here's, we're back. This is the setup for the brewery. You know what the setup is. We know where various parts and vats and tunnels and things should be. We know where the houses were. So this is the device. It's a GPS unit, and it looks kind of like a potato gun bazooka. <laughs> and so how it works is that as you walk, and the GPS ticks off very accurately down to almost a millimeter, it um, sends out an electromagnetic pulse, which essentially makes all the iron in the ground stand up and reflect, and it sets off a pulse that hits the ground at 9 feet, and it hits one at 18 feet. And so it reads their reflective energy. And um, um, not right, you have to take the uh, data and go into the lab and, and print out what's going on down there, but uh, this is essentially what you get. <laughs> um, remember, the red stuff is high iron concentrations, and the blue stuff is hardly any iron at all. Now, as we we're going around this, you can see this is uh, Market Street, and this is where the uh, bookstore used to be, and here's the brewery building, and there's a lot of iron out here, and you would expect it's right next to the highway. There's rebar underneath the sidewalks and other things down here. And then there's other areas over here that are uh, reflecting blue, which means usually means they're empty or they're vacuities. In this case, there's not actually any tunnels out here. We did get an interesting reading here, here but um, because of the asphalt and the concrete, we really, this is a, a geological method that's usually used out in hillsides and cliffs and quarries and things. It's not really designed for urban environment, but it does do some very interesting things. So this is one of the results, uh, not around uh, the building, but over where the Dostal Brewery used to be. And this is the Hamburg Inn here, and this is Paglia's up here. And there's always this place in the middle of the parking lot that's sinking in. And there's another place over here that sinks in every year. And I asked uh, Armin Pagliai about these. He says, yeah, so this year I stuck my rake down in the hole and both of them and I couldn't feel a thing. It cost me $1,000 a piece to fill these in every year. I'd rather not do that. <laughs> but what actually this is, and again, remember we're seeing the blue is vacuities and the, the, this is iron and there is a well out there in that parking lot that is 10 feet across and 80 feet deep. All right? <laughs> and so that's not the thing you want to lose your SV, S, SUV down into when it, when it sinks in every year, especially when it gets hot. There used to be a hou houses right here. And then this is, this is probably a privy or a, a cistern to one of the dwellings that used to be here. But right over here was the huge ice house. Right over here is the old brewmaster's house. In between all these places and all through here and over, all the way over uh, to the other parking lot is riddled with steam tunnels and um, brewery caves and all kinds of things. And they cave in every year. Um, but, and nobody really knows very much where they are. All right, and so uh, three years ago, they lost an SUV in the parking lot out there. The city came and chucked it out of there and filled up the hole, paved it over like nothing happened, unless it was your SUV, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so um, as in urban archeology, span and for people who are developing properties and riverfronts and large buildings or want to know, maybe there's a gas station there and you want to see where the tanks were, you want to you know these underground utilities, this has become an interesting way, oh, let me go back away, um, an interesting way, or a new way, a new millennial way, to use remote sensing to find out where these things are without actually having to dig them up. All right, I mean, you can guess from the plat maps and the aerial photographs and things, but it's not like um, knowing exactly down to less than an inch where these things are so you can hit or miss them. So, being involved with this, uh, something happened in Cedar Rapids, which many people may have heard about, at the old Magnus Brewery. And this was a brewery that was uh, built in 1855. And at one time, after the Dostal Brewery, it was the biggest brewery in the state. And there was two, two breweries side by side, the Magnus Brewery and the Williams Brewery. And right back here is where the tunnels were banked into the hillside. And it's kind of over there 
uh, by where Quaker Oats is and the big lake there that you drive around on 380. This, this is the main shot of the brewery. It caught on fire. They frequently do because there's just many stories of, uh, of cooking malt and, and, and brewing and, and uh, fires going all the time and steam engines and coal and dust and things all over the way. So it didn't look like this the first time. And then it burned and they rebuilt the old building. And then like the Dostal Brewery became very Victorian in its architecture and its effect. Now, these brewery owners were some of the wealthiest men in the state. And some of the first businesses in the state were breweries. And uh, most of the brewers came from Germany. Some came from France, and a few came from Ireland or England or Belgium or, or somewhere like that. But um, Germans were, uh, German Catholics were the primary agents for building these very large and elaborate beer factories. Now, there, were, there was four prohibitions in Iowa um, that were statewide run. Uh, the first one was in 1872. There was uh, an aborted one in 1878. There was a statewide one that they tried to enforce in 1884, in which there was huge beer riots here in Iowa City where people were going to be lynched and they got tarred and feathered and there was gunfights and, um, and you know, it was mob violence at its best, okay? Um, brewers had uh, a lot of money. They hired a lot of people. They had a great influence and uh, really kind of ruled the roost politically and could do very much what they wanted to. Now, remember we were looking at the previous plat map of the brewery, here's the same thing, you got a brewery here and a brewery here and here's the ice house and various other subsidiary buildings and we're kind of facing off to the north here where the, the lake is uh, behind Cargill and uh, Quaker Oats over there. And, and so this way, that is where the town was, but the brewery caves were sunk underneath all these houses for several hundred feet back under there. The brewery was torn down in urban renewal in uh, 1939, early urban renewal, not the one in the 1960s, but they kind of left the beer caves, and the beer caves sat open for a number of years, and people were living in them and partying in them, and and then the city got tired of all that, and they ran everybody out, and then they started filling them up with dirt, but they didn't get them all filled up, and then the highway came through. And this is what it looked like. I don't know how many of you ever remember. This is the highway. This is 380 being built through Cedar Rapids in 1971. All right, nice aerial photograph. All right, here's the lake. Here's the river. Here's uh, Quaker Oats. Here, here's the old power plant. Here's Cargill now, and here's uh, an overpass that stood there for 10 years because they just didn't know what exactly to do. And part of the reason that it stood there for 10 years is because it was over the top of the brewery caves, all right? And there was also not a lot of impetus to uh, uh, move forwards on this project. You can see there used to be the old Italian town and there was Greek town and Irish town were all over in this area. And then by the 1971, they were not extant. You know, they had just raised them to the ground to build the highway, but they never built the highway. They just built this one darn bridge. Um, that's politics, okay? <laughs> well, we all know that big curve through Cedar Rapids, you go past Quaker Oats and Cargill until you head off, you know, to the north down through there. And it's all elevated. You don't really think about it too much, but it's elevated. And, and I got a call one morning from the Department of Transportation bridge crew saying that there's a sinkhole um, underneath one of these uh, uh, supports for the highway. And they had sent down an infrared camera down in there. And one of the bridge guys, who was an ex-spelunker, went down into the hole and got down in there and said, oh my gosh, there's a giant beer cave down here. Um, is this going to affect the highway? <laughs> you know, this, uh, they had 12 inches of rain, I believe it was, in Cedar Rapids last year in one night. And that was the reason that it all got washed down through here and it hit this vacuity down here. Remember when we were looking uh, uh, top views and the technology and you can see where the tunnels were running. We saw views of Underbury Square and what the tunnels looked like. They're big. They're as tall as this room and 
half as wide. Um, it didn't look like much of a sinkhole until you had to go down in it. <laughs> so uh, I looked at it as an opportunity. Everybody I ever told about it later on said, I would never do that in my entire life. I wouldn't go down in there for anything. And they go, well, I saw it as an opportunity. And so we stuck the infrared camera down there, and this is what we saw. And what we saw is a beer cave here with these giant road pilings, pin cushioning, uh, like a pin cushion right through it into the bedrock. All right. And all right, usually it's, it's, it's brewery area. And if there's one cave, there's usually two or six or maybe even this time 11 down there. Well, people want to know where this is because the bridge is on top of it. <laughs> All right. they, they're curious about this. It's, this became an important item. So after I had slipped down the sinkhole about 10 or 15 feet, and then I had to slide through a squeeze and get, roll down this incline, and in order for me to get down in there, they had to take the ladder out to put the lights down in, and I felt pretty secure with an oxygen sensor and a rope around my waist so they could find me later. Um, so this is, uh, I was sitting in the dark, and the only thing I could see with was the flash. Nobody had been in here for 60 or more years. And so it looks a little ghostly here with this beer cave pin cushion. And you can see these piles of uh, remnants of where they tried to fill it in, like bucket load by bucket load, or cart load, or truck load, or whatever it was. You can see up here, this one's stone and not brick. And these are the keystones, and that one worried me a little bit because they don't want the keystone of your arch like falling on you, then the whole thing might come down, maybe not. Um, it seemed pretty sturdy, just considering it had all these giant steel beams sticking through it. It's just some of the views. I took many more views, and but uh, this here you can, you can just see how old and eroded these things are looking. It's like more like going into a piece of limestone cave than it is to something that's man-made, and I could see. Uh, from where I was down here that there was a wall down there, probably 30 or 40 feet, but they weren't paying me to crawl down there for any way. And I just, as long as I knew it was there, okay, that's all I wanted out of it. So I was down there maybe 15 or 20 minutes taking pictures, and I had a tape measure and doing measurements to see how big it was, how long was it, you know, taking these pictures. And um, it wasn't long before I wanted out, and so I proceeded to get out, which was... Not easy that time. It was one of the hardest places I ever had to crawl out of, I'd have to say. So, with that same premise, so we're looking for the beer caves in Iowa City. We know how the breweries are laid out. We know who built them. You know how the buildings are arranged. We know where the caves should be. Just, this time, they're not in downtown Iowa City. They're under an overpass in 380 in Cedar Rapids. So, we're going to use, to start with, uh, some you know, historical research in what's called geo-referencing. And that's where you take old maps and modern aerial photographs and, and uh, global positioning and three-dimensional mapping and have an idea without even going down there where the tunnels should be. So part of it goes with we've, we took the old maps and we overlaid all the original lot lines. So this is, this is the road, all right? Here's 380 right here. Um, this is the off-ramps. Here is uh, Cargill right here. And right here by these tanks is where the sinkhole, it, well, no, these tanks is where the sinkholes are, where the tunnels were for the breweries. The breweries are right here on the edge of the bluff, and their tunnels went out way out under here. Well, if you had one sinkhole, maybe you're going to have another one. And so they were really um, interested in, in you know, figuring this out. Not only were they interested in it, but FEMA was going to uh, do the flood control project berms, and they wanted, they had, they, this was a big spot to connect all their flood control berms to, but they didn't want to connect the flood control berms to a place that was honeycombed with old giant tunnels. Uh, engineering wise, it was not a good idea. And the Department of Transportation sent me the original maps that they had done in the surveys and corings for the construction of the overpass. And I got to looking at it and I go, well, that's clearly a hole. There's a hole and that one's 120 feet long. And there's most of a hole and some of it's filled in and there's most of a hole and there's one that's like filled in or collapsed. But uh, clearly there's six different tunnels down here somewhere. And well, where are they? So the DOT geologist 
in a, a, a geo reference spatial maps from the original corings, and this is how it looks like from the top. This is the uh, bluff, and here's the lake out here. Here's where the road corings were. This is looking at it from the side, and this is where the corings go down, and it's kind of, the scale's not good, but you can see little spots there that are empty, and here it is looking at it from 3D. So geospatially, we're really able to come in very closely to knowing where these were, where they were in relationship to all the previous buildings that were there, uh, and what was it going to take to find the rest of them. Well, it turned out that that was the interesting part <laughs> of the whole thing, starting with, uh, on the first day, using ground-penetrating radar. Uh, people probably hear about this, but, I mean, it's become a pretty commonplace thing in archaeology and geology, and the uh, uh, cost for these pieces of equipment have dropped from thirty to $50,000 down to about $5,000. So if you gotta round somebody up on the first day and you know a couple hours notice, this is the way we went. So we're under the viaduct here. We're cleaning off the ground. We're we're getting ready to set up the ground penetrating radar. Here we're uh, um, tabulating and setting up the machinery. It kind of looks like you're pulling a heavy lawnmower behind you more or less. And so we're laying out uh, the lines here. These are going to be transects that we're going to follow with the machine. The machine's like a giant radar set, and the closest thing we all have to one of these is the microwave in your kitchen, okay? <laughs> so as it's going along, it too is pulsing out uh, microwaves, and they're being reflected back. Here's operation where, you know, there's traffic up above, and the trucks are running up there, and the cargo plants are operating, and we're down underneath this thing, and it's a pretty hot day. And so, uh, this is where we were going to start. Here's, here's the abutments to the bridge. Here's the original sinkhole. Here's the grids we laid out to follow. And uh, we knew there was a cave here because that was the original one. So the first time we ran across that as, as a test, the operator's saying, whoa, this looks like there's something really there. There's something really down there. And I go, well, I know that. I just crawled down in there. But what about all the rest of them. So as we moved it down, I noticed some other spots that looked kind of suspicious with subsidence. And so we ran one here, and then there was another cave. And then we ran one next to that, and there was a cave next to that. And then we ran another one over here under this one. And uh, these are not to scale, I'll get to a better scale. But you can, you can see these, uh, the uh, ground penetrating radar images that this is at like two meter depths, and some of them are at uh, 15 meter depths and things. But what, we, what you get back, and this is looking at it from the top, all right, here's, here's the first cave and the sinkhole, and you, you get this uh, uh, vacuities, it's called, these reflections coming back. These aren't as long, we didn't have as much room. Now, this is just like a two-dimensional way of looking at it. When you get the data in, then you get something, and this is what you get. You get a three-dimensional look at it. And um, these are how many meters down it's going, and these are the walls right here of the tunnels. This is empty spots. And the arrow here is saying that this is re reverse polarity. The black and white indicates a void, all right? If they pointed the other way, it, it would be full. And, and the walls look like this because it's solid. So we knew there was another cave down there. I'd crawled into one. We found the second one and another one, you know, easy enough with this. And it looked very promising. Department of Transportation were interested in it, and so we wrote the report and we sent that in, and then it had to kind of go to the next level. Oops, I mean, this is the three dimensional. Remember when I was talking about being down in there, it's all full of back dirt and fill and, and loads of uh, junk? Well, that's what we're seeing here. We're actually seeing every kind of truckload and pile that's on the floor of in the cave, and this is the empty spots in between them, and this is the walls over here, and here's a wall over here, and this is looking at it in a vertical uh, uh, two-dimensional uh, view. So we went to the next step after that. Those turned out to be very positive. We had our results back in just a few days. We could tell the DOT, yes, these caves are down there. Yes, they're mostly intact. Yes, there's probably more of them, and well, 
where do you, where do you go from there? So we w went through this uh, technique called electroresistivity, which actually um, you put uh, uh, spikes in the ground, you run a current through it, you loop a bunch of cords around. This, this is the easy explanation. And um, it will read down to 50 feet um, through resistivity to the electricity th flowing through the ground, um, a three-dimensional view. And it, it, you look at the equipment and you think it could never be so easy. <laughs> it's not exactly easy, but uh, there's a lot involved. It was a very dry winter day, and in order to get it to work, we had to go buy bottles of water, pour them on the, the stakes in order to uh, get the resistivity to work, because unless it's slightly damp, the electricity doesn't have any place to flow. And so, remember we were setting up for the ground penetrating radar. Well, this is the uh, 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 geologists uh, setting up for this resistivity test. It looks like you got like two miles of extension cord, essentially, which is kind of what it is. And you got a car battery and, and um, a very expensive piece of e equipment and more extension cord. Now, each, oops, um, let me go back one, I'm sorry. That's way that one. Each each one of these um, is a spike going down into the ground, and these are all wild, wired in sequence, and they loop on each other, and loop on each other. And there's another one, and there's another one, and there's these are all set in by um, global positioning systems. So we knew within like less than a centimeter for each one where they were. Now, if you're going to do a, maybe five acres, well, you need a lot more cordage, and so we set up transects. And um, each one of these is one of those stakes, metal stakes going down in the ground. And you can see uh, the amount of uh, wire it's taking. Each one of these, this is how we laid it out there in, in the curb. This is the highway. This is the original building lots. This is where the breweries were. This is where the caves came out. Each one of these dots is one of those little rods in the ground that has been geo-positioned. Uh, we started this way, and we have a long one this way, and then crossways and crossways until we had a, a really uh, well laid out um, set of transects that uh, could show us um, whether it was going to hit anything or not. Again, now this is the uh, uh, magnetic inductive technique, where this is the one, remember, that pulses off, makes the iron stand up, and reads the reflection. So two different things. Two different methods, but they're both when they come together, they give us a much better view. <laughs> All right, so this, here we're looking at this, the resistivity, and this is uh, about three, about a 200 feet across and 50 feet down, and this is one transect or one slice through that acreage, and uh, this is a second slice through the acreage, and here's uh, the final one, and remember that. Uh, here, here's empty space, here's empty space. Here's an, a, a space that was empty, but it's like f all full of iron. This one down here, you can see the tops of another tunnels here. You can see deeper elements of spaces and spaces and spaces. And here, you can see well, all kinds of things way down in the ground, 50 feet down, far deeper than probably the cave should be, but we don't know how deep they are. But we're looking at this in a, uh, just through all those extension cords and the, and the wiring and the stakes, given this uh, horizontal uh, and, and vertical kind of layout of where the tunnels are in the ground, how big they are, and whether they're filled up or not. Using the, uh, uh, the resonance method, the conductivity me method, you can see here's one of the tunnels poking, poking out from underneath the road. Here's, here's a drainage area. Here's maybe the end of one that's empty. Here, this is another run. This is at nine feet, and this one's at 20 feet. Here again, we see that uh, one that's kind of full of iron and dirt right here. We see an empty one coming out over here. Well, this is a pretty positive uh, effect and, and result. So um, by the time we got done with the complicated data, we could just see a plethora, you might say, of all kinds of tunnels running across underneath this stretch ground beneath the, the supports of the, of the highway overpass. And, and again, just uh, some other views of various ways across, and they change, you know, like from here to your seat, you'll get one view, and then 
you know, five rows back, you'll get a line and another view and another view, and that's kind of what these are. These are like slices, like pieces of bread across 50 feet of ground that's being tested. Um, all right, these are the tunnels. This is what it looks like in Brewery Square. This is what it looks like when it's abandoned and been pincushioned <laughs> and lost for 60 years in Cedar Rapids underneath the highway. This is how you find a tunnel with a bulldozer. All right, this is one that was encountered in Cedar Rapids when they were excavating the highway, and they ran into it, and you could, you could get your bulldozer stuck in there. You really could. <laughs> this is what it looks like, the same thing, without digging anything, without making a hole in anything, through ground-penetrating radar. Here's, here's the tunnel. Here's the tunnel. You got to be able to interpret the results, obviously. I mean, to a lot of people, it wouldn't make a lot of sense, but uh, when you know what, what you're seeing, then um, it really tells you a great deal. Now remember, um, the, here is the inductive technique where we're seeing a, a tunnel and a well looking straight down from the top in an aerial photograph, and here's a similar condition in a slice uh, from the ground surface to 50 feet down in the ground across an area nearly 250 feet across. So, um, as that's, I'm getting to the finish here. I just, the amount of people that, that helped me with this, uh, the DOT uh, bridge crew, Mike Perry, the state archeologist, Glenn Story, the GPR operator, and professor of anthropology, Carolyn Davis, a, a hydroscience geologist, and the engineer, Jason Fogelsagang, a, a geologist for the geologic, Iowa Geologic Survey, Matt Tranium, Iowa DOT geologist, Mark Hunter, uh, Cedar Rapids History Center. All right, we have a lot of people that came together to really produce some really interesting images, and nobody had to go back down and will ever go back down in that silly cave again. We can do it all from the surface. We can do it with technology. It'll work anywhere. All right, I mean, it doesn't work over uh, concrete paved roads with rebar or, you know, there's certain things that can't work over, but in, in general ground surfaces and things, um, it's it's... The, to me the thing in the future, back to the 19th century, <laughs> you know, these people build these amazing buildings, these giant beer factories, and there were all, everything was horse drawn, every piece of rock was hand cut, you know, the holes for these giant buildings were dug out and they started from the rock they took out of it to build the tunnels and then build them up like three or four or five stories, and so Really, to me, there's a great connectivity here between what was there and ways to find the ones that are lost or other conditions. As I said, sinkholes or uh, mine subsidence or lost uh, steam tunnels or um, riverbeds or filled in foundations or oil tanks or areas with uh, brown, you know, brown area pollution and and uh, really puts another view without actually having the person take the risk to go and dig a hole or climb down in there or um, any of that anymore. So uh, thank you very much, and I guess it's question time. And I can call the question. <laughs> Sure. Mm -hmm. The um, roof has is appropriately placed now, I guess, because uh -huh. it's on Market Street. Right. <laughs> a lot of the activity, a lot of the pastry cake uh -huh. on top of the, the cake. So if you were going to go to Brew Fest and you wanted, and it's, we don't know this, I think there's some brewers in the audience who might know it, what would be the appropriate beer? What kind of beer should they brew? Um, Different breweries brewed different recipes. I think uh, Pilsner was the Union Brewery's beer, and the other two uh, were Lagers. The Dostal Brewery actually uh, sold their um, uh, recipe and patent on that to a Wisconsin brewer, and it became Ryan Angling, Ang Erlinger beer or something out of Wisconsin. It actually is still being produced at some level. And, and um, so, I mean, these old recipes are continuing, even though the places they came from and the um, European guys were long gone, but the recipes survived. So would those have just... Go ahead. A, a, an interest of mine, how, would, how high an alcohol level 
would those um, have been? It, very a great deal. The German, uh, the Catholic Society in Iowa City and Cedar Rapids and many places uh, around the Midwest here, the Germans and the Irish and the Czechs very much had grown up as young people to adults with drinking beer. The water was not any good. You couldn't trust any of it. Uh, the beer alcohol was the only safe thing to drink and they made beers for children and they made beers for all ages and they made Bach beers in the fall and, and various other ones at times, you know, um, just like we do now. But drinking to them was a nor uh, was eating. It was a normal everyday occurrence and, and generally they all handled it very well. There's always the ones that don't handle it so well, but it was very much a, uh, a socialized event. In the beer halls, there was out uh, where the pool is and City Park out there was a giant beer hall you know, across from uh, the log cabins, and, and, and it was part of their social structure, it was part of their menu and their fu uh, foods, and um, it was a medicine, and it was a beverage. And when you can't drink water, what are you gonna drink? <laughs> Do we have other questions? I wondered if from the Cedar Rapids investigation, did the DOT make any changes or feel concerned about uh, their highway or? It's still under um, consideration. The thing is, uh, we determined from the very beginning that the highway is safe, all right? Although those 50 foot uh, spears through the caves, go, they go way down into the bedrock. So the road is totally supported and doesn't even know those uh, beer caves are down there. If you have enough of those empty spaces collapsed, yes, it can uh, affect a roadway, but they wanted to be sure, all right? I mean, there's tens of thousands of people have drive around that curve every day. They wanted to absolutely be confident, and they were very quick to announce after the initial um, study came back that, yes, these are safe, we're not closing the road or anything like that. So, um, I mean, that was, that public safety was their priority and the safety of their half a billion dollar investment through there. Um, I came 10 minutes late, so sure. I don't know if you covered this in the beginning. Uh, were any of those voids natural, like dried up uh, streams, underground streams, or are they all man-made constructed and can they be repurposed? Well. That's a good question. There's been some talk about redoing the caves, but there was determined that you can't have tours on them because of the traffic. There's no way to get to them except down a sinkhole. Now, there was very interesting that uh, the caves don't go 50 feet down into the rock there, but something empty is down there, all right? And, and it seemed from, there was many more of those slices of, of the area that there are other things, and there probably are um, drainages, not vacuities, not empty spaces per se, but honeycomb pieces of limestone. Now, could there be natural caves down there? I mean, we're kind of on the edge of a karst cave area, and certainly there could be caves back there that nobody's ever discovered or whatever. So um, they're only concerned with how far it is in the surface, but it was, uh, I think very informative that so far down, there were very large empty spaces that nobody had even a clue that were probably way too low for uh, brewery caves. First of all, could those have been like an ancient civilization usage down there further below the beer caves? Um, it's unlikely. There certainly were Native Americans in that area at one time. The, mostly the construction of the city's surface topography had uh, eliminated a lot of those other. Uh, so it, at that depth, unless it was poking out of the bluff, literally, with like a, uh, a, a cavern sticking out, yes, they would have used that. Now, do we know that? No, <laughs> there was similar situations that had happened in Iowa City that you know, they were excavating uh, the, the basketball stadium and suddenly came across a rock shelter down there that nobody had any idea about and it was certainly um, uh, full of Native American artifacts. So there 
it's undiscovered. It's not impossible, but uh, you'd have to have some other way to look at it. What is the depth range between the uh, two devices, the GPS and the G GPR? Well, uh, the resonance is, uh, goes down about 20 feet. Uh, the resistivity goes down to about 50 feet. If you got enough energy into it, you can make it go down as far as you want to at, at, at some point. I mean, you can go down hundreds of feet with it, potentially. So, okay. and you know. One more question sure. was, you had the kind of zebra stripe mm -hmm. depths there. Which was the void, the black or the white? Both of them are the void. It depends on their, what they are reflections. All right, if they're, it's if they're reflecting this way, it's empty. If it's reflecting this way, it's solid. And if it's horizontal, it's solid rock. Okay. A lot of uptown Cedar Rapids was full of quicksand. And when it, the city first started, they, uh, and the, one of the owners of one of these breweries wanted to build a hotel downtown, and they kept hitting quicksand. So it's not impossible that some of these things are full of sand or they're uh, um, artesian-like um, wells or something on that order. So, I mean, sure. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll end if you could talk a little bit about the beer riot. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> well, the beer riot, uh, as I was earlier saying, um, the people made a great deal of money. I mean, they were multimillionaires in terms of uh, the property ownership and, and what they had in the bank. They owned the banks, or they were the banks, all right? Um, in 1884, Iowa passed its third prohibition and um, outlawing alcohol in the state of Iowa. Generally, what would happen, they tried it before, is that everybody ignored it. <laughs> You know, everybody, all the river towns ignored it. Um, um, other places in the state ignored it, and there was more than one beer riot. What happened was that Iowa City uh, public government at that time was being run by what one might call Methodists, and then the breweries were being run by the Catholics. The Methodists had the political power, and the brewers had the political power and money, and so. On, on the day that the uh, prohibition went into effect, they couldn't sell their beer, and so uh, they just kind of took it out of the vaults and just gave it away. Well, that got everybody kind of worked up, and it got the city worked up, because it's not supposed to be any alcohol, and the two lawyers uh, in the city government decided they were gonna prosecute them, and so they did. About uh, two or three uh, weeks later, they prosecuted uh, one of these brewers, and. Um, he was uh, intensely unhappy about that, actually, and um, and so uh, and and the, everybody, the hundreds of people that worked for these folks, were unhappy about it, and the populace in general was pretty unhappy about it, and so they all kind of congregated where the Van Allen Hall is now. It used to be Church Park. It was a big empty park that ran all the way between uh, Gilbert and Dubuque Street. And they started gathering down there on the 4th of July. And they started like gravitating towards uh, the brewery area because they were kind of giving away some beer again. And then they got kind of carried away and they um, kind of broke into the breweries and they just started giving beer out to everybody. So this huge crowd formed. And um, well, there was trouble, okay? <laughs> and then they got prosecuted again and uh, they were, doubly upset about the whole thing. They thought it was not just, and so they went, um, how did it go? Uh, these two lawyers who were the prosecutors, actually they, they were so angry that they were going to lynch them. And so they went out on the edge of town, on the eastern side of town, at one of the sh uh, local justice of the peace and sheriff's house, and he kind of hid them out. And the brewers formed this large mob of workers and then wagons. They had a wagon train that ran from Iowa City like two or three miles to this guy's house, all of angry individuals who wanted beer. And they stood outside the house and um, started causing trouble and then they started shooting through the doors of the house and then the, the grandmother there was all upset that they're shooting through the house and, and um, 
then these a uh, uh, couple of lawmen showed up to get rid of the crowd, but they're um, you know it was like 500 to three, so they pulled them out of the crowd and tarred and feathered them. And two or two of the other uh, sub attorneys that were involved, they snuck off. They got loose with tar and feathers on them and, and walked back into town, taking all the back roads and streams. And so finally, late at night, uh, or at least dusk or, or so, um, the sheriff and the grandmother and the wife and the kids all came out and pleaded with all these like ruffian people to go home. And uh, Dostal and uh, one of the other one, Hots, I think, or one of them, Geiger, he said, okay, let's turn around, all right? So when he said turn around, everybody, the entire group went back into Iowa City, and he went back into Church Park, and unfortunately, uh, a couple of the lawyers who were uh, the cause or intent of much of this trouble were seen, and so uh, they were going through this crowd, and they snatched them up, and they were hauling them off to lynch them, and some of the townsfolks got together and uh, got some rifles and pistols and came down and took these guys away from these hooligans, these brewing people, and they were not far from the breweries over there, and they'd gone another block, they'd probably had never come back. And, and so they got a hold of these guys, and somewhere just past like the Deadwood on the other side of the street, um, they surrounded them with their guns in the air and hid these guys out in one of the buildings downtown until the mob kind of lost track of them. And so this telegraph went out to other places, Ames and um, Marengo and um, others across the state, and they were going to like get on the train and all come here and like really raise some heck. And not many of them ever did come here, but there was plenty of other people, uh, hundreds, 500 or more, that just kind of wandered around causing mischief and mayhem and a little bit of looting and intimidation and... Um, that went on for quite a while until they all got worn out eventually and uh, went home. <laughs> so um, nobody actually got killed. One fellow was beaten very badly uh, by the mob, and uh, one of the brewers actually did most of the damage. And he sued them for $250,000, which in 1880 money is like $10 million or $15 million now at least. And uh, actually, he went to, K it went to court, and he won. And um, he didn't get the full amount, but he got a large bit of it. I mean, he was near death and, and, and disfigured for life. And so all the bearers got together, pooled their money, and paid the court costs and walked away. So then when, when the, the prohibition was repealed again by 1885, they just fired up and started doing the whole thing all over again. All right, <laughs> they did it like that until prohibition came, and then when prohibition uh, in came, uh, a lot of people in Iowa City, of course, would just get on the train with their luggage, go over to Illinois to Rock Island, load up on beer and alcohol, and bring it back into Iowa. All right, so um, it, generally they just ignored all the prohibition laws, the state prohibition laws, and a lot of states had trouble enforcing those things. Nobody really wanted to do it until the federal government got involved in the final one, as we all know about. And then that one, once the federal gov government shut them all down, that was the end of it, all right? Then they had to, that's when they started making soda pop. And, well, near beer, I think they started with near beer and a couple of them, but nobody wanted near beer. And so they started uh, producing uh, soda, and that went on for a very short time also, and then they all gave up and just started selling ice. So <laughs> that's kind of how it ended up. That's, that's the short story, I guess, of it. But uh <laughs> So we have one, time for one more question. Oh, Hang on. Unrest in IOC last. How long did that last? Oh, it, was, it went on uh, for weeks. One of the brewers, who, the guy who almost beat this guy to death, was on the city council, OK? <laughs> So, um, and these, these people had money and they had influence and they had thousands of workers who wanted beer also. And the entire Catholic community wanted it. And, um, well, eventually. Uh, so I would say it went on, on and off for 
uh, that intense stuff maybe a week or two. And then it would be on and off for nearly a year and then it was like repealed. Now when Prohibition came in here, all the production went up to Chewyville. And that's where they made like Moonshine and other places around the county over here. But uh, that also ended when they were all robbed and murdered by one of their nephews. But uh, uh, it's just kind of the way it worked around here until Prohibition was repealed and, you know, things went back to business as, as usual. But all these 1850s brewers were gone. I mean, uh, most of them had sold out uh, by the 1890s and, and, um, or, and the one burned down in 1906 and I, it was a kind of suspicious fire, you might say. And so that kind of put the end to a great deal of it. Well, thank you very, very much. Well, you're all welcome, and thanks for listening.